Welcome to Later 20th Century and Contemporary Literature Continued. Yes, <clears throat> we're spending more time on this uh, time period in literature that encompasses so many writers with whom we may or may not be familiar, but uh, whose works touch upon our times now. So many to include and much to talk about. All right, that brings us to Lucille Clifton. Yes, and the work of hers we read this week, it's a poem called To My Last Period, which of course is a topic that we have addressed fittingly in women's in literature several times over now on um, how fertility and women's um, capacity to bear children um, affects our living conditions or affects um, their lives and um, priorities and necessities and um, their roles in um, their families and their roles in their wider community and history itself. All right, so let's take a look at Lucille Clifton, an American. Yes, she is an American. She was born in 1936 in Depew, New York, and died not too long ago, but in 2010 at the age of 73. She's a two-time Pulitzer Prize nominee in poetry, uh, so that's pretty neat. Her father was a steel worker and her mother a laundress. In other words, somebody who does laundry um, to make money. She was also a homemaker and, interestingly, an amateur poet. So perhaps Lucille Clifton's abilities uh, trace themselves from her mother. Uh, who knows? It doesn't say whether her father was also um, literary in one way or another. <clears throat> but we do know her mother was an amateur poet. Lucille Clifton studied drama at Howard University, which, um, if you're not familiar with it, it is um, a historically black college. Um, you know, one of the colleges that was made um, for black students to attend because, you know, back way back when there was a lot of prejudice and um, even universities not allowing uh, black students to attend. So these um, historically black colleges rose up to fill in the gap, both um, for students who couldn't attend elsewhere and for students who maybe wanted to have um, a student body uh, whose experience um, maybe mirrored more of their own, or at least that they could feel um, very comfortable with to discuss whatever they wanted, you know, and uninhibited by prejudice. All right. Um, Lucille attended Howard along with one of our other authors we're reading, uh, Chloe Wofford, who, as you may re recall, her her uh, pseudonym or the name by which she wrote, she writes literature or wrote literature uh, was Toni Morrison. So Toni from her middle name, which is Anthony. So Chloe Anthony Wofford is her name. Toni short for that. And then Morrison, last name. Um, I don't know if you necessarily want to call that a pseudonym, but it's the name that she wrote under. Uh, and um, Lucille Clifton's husband also attended college there, Fred Clifton, whom she married in 1958. <clears throat> Lucille later transferred to Fredonia Teachers College in 1959, or not in 1959, she later transferred um, to te the Teachers College. And in 1959, Lucille lost her 44-year-old mother to a fatal illness, sadly. Um, so she wouldn't have, Lucia would not have been that old then, maybe about 23 when that happened, um, of course, which is a significant um, life event for any child, you know, at any age. But, you know, the younger, the more of an impact it is because the longer of your life you have without such a formative figure. And um, yeah. So after college, Lucille worked as an actor, interestingly, like some of our other authors, right, that we read about, um, you know, tr tried their hand at acting or did act like Susan Glassbell and uh, we have a few others too. Um, she also worked as an employment claims clerk and then as a literature assistant for the Washington, D.C. Office of Education from 1960 to 19. 71. This was a long time. While there, Lucille also started bearing and rearing her six 
children. Yes, six. Yep, that's a lot of kids, right? Uh, especially by today's standards, you know, way back when, you know, when there wasn't birth control and when a lot of children would die young to early childhood diseases or were stillborn, et cetera, um, women tended to have a big, big families with lots and lots of children. Uh, but of course, nowadays, six children sounds sounds like quite a bit. I have seven, so I can attest. At one point, Lucille had six children, all under the age of 11, four of whom were in diapers all at the same time. So yes, I'm sure her hands were full. Uh, and this was at a time when hampers were not yet invented. So that means she was laundering all those diapers. Yeah. I can't even imagine how long that would take, like how much of your day would cons be consumed by the chore of changing diapers and laundering them uh, and feeding children and taking care of them. I mean, and this is what uh, Virginia Woolf talks about, that in order to write, a woman or anyone needs a room of, of his or her own and, and needs a means of support, you know, so that they're not, all their time isn't occupied doing the job that needs to be done to earn support so that you have time left over to write and to think and and the room of one's own of course is to have a space where one can think undisturbedly so um here's how lucille handled that since she had six children and so much work to do during the day she developed the talent of composing poems wholly in her mind while she was performing the daily tasks of raising a family so quite creative there she was a multitasker for sure. And obviously she multitasked well, since we have all of these great poems from her. She was nominated for the Pulitzer Prize in Poetry twice. And, uh, you know, she's left us quite, quite the uh, literary legacy here. Uh, when Lucille had time to herself, she would eventually write those poems down, the ones that she'd been working on all day in her head. So really neat technique to get around not necessarily always having a means of support that didn't require your work and not necessarily having a room of her own. She had her room in her mind during the day and then at night she would go write them down when she finally had time to herself. Uh, poet friend Robert Hayden took some of Lucille's poetry and entered it in the 1969 YWYMHA Poetry Center Discovery Competition, which Lucille's poetry one. The award also entailed the publication of the winning poetry, becoming Lucille's first poetry collection called Good Times, which the New York Times called one of the 10 best books of 1969. So pretty neat. She went from an unknown to having her poems entered in this contest, and suddenly the New York Times is calling her book one of the 10 best ever to be published in 1969. The instant notoriety earned Lucille a position as poet in residence at Copper State College in Maryland. Lucille has since continued with professorships. Um, well, well, she's, I'm sorry, she's since continued with professorships at several universities, including George Washington University, University of California at Santa Cruz, St. Mary's College of Maryland, and even Columbia University and Ivy League. And we know um, some of our other poets attended there too, right? Um, you know, remember anthropology way back when Franz Boas, you remember who studied under Franz Boas at Columbia University? That was Zora Neale Hurston. Yeah, so following in those footsteps there. From 1979 to 1985, Lucille even served as Poet Laureate of Maryland. Poet Laureate of Maryland. That means the chief poet for the entire state of Maryland. In fact, Lucille is the first author to have two books of poetry nominated as finalists for the Pulitzer Prize in the very same year. So she was that uh, productive of a writer that not only did she write two collections of poetry in one year, but they were both so good that they were nominated for the Pulitzer Prize that year, both of them. In asserting an identity different 
from that of canonical Western verse or, or Western verse canon. So what is accepted as, as traditional literature recognized as, you know, traditionally classically good literature and in striving to embody the African American experience instead, Lucille developed a unique poetics marked by quote, concise, untitled free verse lyrics of mostly iambic trimeter lines, occasional slant rhymes, anaphora, and other forms of repetition, puns and allusions, lowercase letters, sparse punctuation, and a lean lexicon of rudimentary but evocative words, unquote. Uh, and iambic, that's that, that rhythm of ba-dum, ba-dum, ba-dum. So it's where it's unstressed followed by stress. So ba-dum, it's kind of like the heartbeat, the sound that the heartbeat makes, ba-dum, ba-dum, ba-dum. And trimeter means there are three of those sets of um, syllables per line of her poem. So, ba-dum, 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 that would be three. Ba-dum, that's one, ba-dum, two, ba-dum, three. So the poem would go, ba-dum, 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 one line. Another line, ba-dum, 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 another line, ba-dum, 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 another line, ba-dum, ba-dum, ba-dum. So that would be the rhythm of a lot of Lucille Clifton's verse. You have to analyze our poem and see the of hers that we read this week and see what you think of that. Um, slant lines and anaphora and um, puns, allusions, lowercase letters, all you see what, see if you can find those things in um, the poem of hers we read this week. Lucille's unconventional poetry was inspired by her rich and varied life experience. Her parents were of the feisty working class. At college, she associated with other African American intellectuals, including Toni Morrison, Leroy Jones, Sterling A. Brown, and A.B. Spellman. At 23, as I mentioned earlier, she lost her mother. And in 1984, she lost her husband. Of course, she birthed and cared for six children, quite a fertile experience in and of itself. And here's a quote. In many ways, her themes are traditional. She writes of her family experience because she is greatly interested in making sense of their lives and relationships. She writes of adversity and success in the ghetto community, and she writes of her role as a poet, unquote. These quotes were from the anthology of, of the ones I've quoted already. Lucille's poems, like the one we read, we read for class, To My Last Period, which was published in 1991, often discuss in frankness and even humor the transcendent evident in and via everyday objects and common familiar experiences, the unique contributions of the African-American experience, as well as female power and perse perseverance in the face of often inscrutable adversity from her, inform her poetry. Lucille has also written numerous children books and even a matrilineal narrative of her own ancestry called Generations, a memoir, published in 1976, which is interesting because, you, you know, Alex Haley published Roots um, around the same period, tracing his own um, ancestry, you know, from a, an, a, from a person being brought from Africa and then enslaved in the United States. Uh, and then tracing the descendants of that family um, here in the United States. And hers, uh, Clifton starts with a captured Dahomeyan girl, in other words, from Dahomey, which I think is now the country of Benin. Uh, she was brought from that country to the United States and she was enslaved there in 1830. Um, the narrative proceeds with a slave's girl's descendants, much as Roots does with, with its own, with Alex Haley's descendants. So. Uh, quite an interesting read. In an induction speech to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, Lucille asserted, quote, so often people think that intelligence is just about the mind. But you know, especially in the humanities, you do have to explore both the mind and the heart. Nobody is just mind. Absolutely nobody. Balance is the law of the universe to balance the inside and the outside of people. It's important, unquote, what was from Lucille Clifton herself.
Now, I invite you to read more about Lucille Clifton in our anthology. And of course, I invite you to read the really, the really fun work of hers called um, to My Last Period. And I had mentioned a couple devices, anaphora, slant rhyme. That's where rhymes are near rhymes, not quite. Anaphora is where we truncate expressions, shorten them. All right, enjoy her poetry. Look for those.